Good day to you, wherever you are, what time of day this is. Uh, this is Greg Asia coming to you from River Rock Church in Colorado Springs with a very important message that I'm going to ask you to be open and listen to very attentively. This message, I believe, is going to be the most important message you'll ever hear, not because of me or because of what I'm saying, but because of the subject and the topic I'm going to cover. But I want you to think. I want you to be open. I want you to think. Something that we sometimes don't do with everything going on in life. But I want you to think. I'm going to say that over and over during this message. And I don't want to be redundant or repetitive. I don't want to annoy you by saying that. But I really want you to just stop and think about what I'm going to share. And just use your brain and just think about what I'm saying. Because it's really hard for people to get things in their heart if they can't get it past their head. The, the heart can't receive what the mind shuts down. If you don't accept something mentally or, or are open to it mentally, you can never get it into your heart, the real part of you. I covered that the last time, I believe, about we are a three-part being. You are a spirit. We are a spirit. We have a soul, our emotions, our mind, our intellect, and of course we have a body. But the real you, the real me, is that spirit that lives in us it's really the heart the Bible speaks of. But you, if you can't get it past your mind and think about it and accept it or at least analyze it, then it will never get to your heart. So I want you to think about what is truth. I want to be talking about uh, the true belief system. What is, the, what is truth? What is truth? Okay? There are different belief systems out there in the world. But what is truth? Now, some people have the mistaken idea that there are no absolute truths. And if somebody were to say that to you, or if you would say that to me, that there are no absolute truths, my response would be to you is, is that absolutely true? What you just said, is that true? If somebody says there's no absolute truth, then the response to that is, is that true? What you just said. So it's a circular argument. So I, I'm going to ask you to be open. I know there are many different arguments to refute the Bible, the Word of God. There's all kinds of belief systems out there. Okay, the first issue, of course, is does God even exist? Which to me is pretty crazy, but there are some people who don't believe God exists. Well, you can't even look at creation. Creation screams loud that there's a God. The sun, the moon, the stars, our beings, life. Before I became a Christian, I didn't know Jesus, but I, I remember growing up on the East Coast. And I would sit out there by the Atlantic Ocean in New Jersey when I was in high school and look across the Atlantic and just look at this creation. Creation screams loud that there's a God. That evolution that we just came to, into existence by just chance is beyond impossible. In fact, the Bible says you've got to be a fool to believe that. And Romans 1 talks about when people look at creation, it, it speaks loud about who God is. It says the invisible things of him, God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. He's talking about creation. So that issue of God should be settled. Now, you might have a different take on it than what the Bible says, but I, this is going to be a three part, at least a three part, two or three part series I'm going to be talking about here. And I want you to just pay attention and focus because I believe if you, if you listen to what I'm saying and follow along, I think I will show you undoubtedly and unequivocally that the Bible is true compared to all other quote religious books or belief systems out there, the Bible hands down, it's not even close, proves that the God of the Bible is the one true God, if you're open. Now, some people aren't open, so I'm speaking to you who are open. And if those of you who are just at least open, even though you might not be convinced, stay with me, because I'm going to share something to you that I believe will be convincing beyond and compelling beyond doubt. So people talk about, you know, again, is there a God? Well, I think it's pretty clear there's a God, and we could talk about that at another time, but creation speaks loud, there's a God. We got trillions of cells in our body. How does that happen? They're like little factories, little cities. The Bible, this is a word. People question the Bible. I'll get into that later on, uh, even today or probably another time in this series. The manuscripts, people question the Bible. When you look at the historical documents from antiquity, of other people in antiquity, like Homer and Aristotle and, and, and Socrates, people don't even question the legitimacy of those documents. And they were written 
well, well, far well after the time that they existed compared to the Bible, especially the New Testament, they were, that was written in the lifetime of the first century believers. So the scriptures, you know, people try to manipulate the Bible and say, well, there's mistakes and contradictions. That's not true. It's a bunch of baloney. Science. There's plenty of science that corroborates the Bible. So I'm going to talk about something and focus on in this first part that can't be refuted. If somebody wants to argue science, if they want to argue the manuscript, if they want to argue about the Bible contradictions or anything like that, there's one subject matter you very hear so many people talking about that I think unequivocally, hands down, slam dunks, is convincing that the Bible, the Holy Bible, the Word of God, is the Word of God, is the Word of the one true God. And that issue is prophecy. Now, that's not my topic, but that issue is what I'm going to talk about in the very beginning here, because one third of the Bible almost is prophecy. About 28%, almost one third is prophecy. So what is prophecy? Prophecy is declaring future events in very specific details. Declaring future events in very specific details. That's prophecy. It could be anywhere from a thousand, thousands of years beforehand or hundreds of years beforehand. So how does that happen? How does what somebody prophesied several thousand years beforehand come to fruition 2,000 years later. How does that happen? And it's not by, you, you can't just say, well, it was just a lucky guess. There's too many prophecies like that in the Bible that to, for someone to say it was just a lucky guess. So there are over 300 prophecies in the Bible that talk about the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. Over 300, over 300 of them. So some of these prophecies might be a little bit fuzzy and a little bit difficult to understand, but there are a lot of them that are really plain, that are really clear, and a person has to have a preconceived notion and harden their heart not to believe that that prophecy is saying this is about Jesus. Well, it's pretty clear. And I'm going to go over some of those, not probably on this lesson, on this session, but the next one, and I'll ask you to stay open, think, use your brain. One of the greatest things that God gave us was a brain. And unfortunately, we don't use it like we should and just stop and ponder about things that are right around us. Now, there was a gentleman by the name of Peter Stoner. He was a mathematician and astronomer. He taught at the uh, College of uh, uh, City College of Pasadena, and he wrote a book uh, uh, it, called Science Speaks. And he analyzed these prophecies that are in the Bible about Jesus. And this guy was a brilliant guy, and then he had his work analyzed by another group that wasn't even associated with him from a mathematical and astronomical standpoint. And they said, yeah, what he's saying is right on point regarding the probability, the probability of, the, of, of, of at least eight prophecies. Now think about this. He did an analysis of at least eight prophecies out of the over 300 about the coming Messiah. Only eight of them. He did that with some of his students and his staff. They crunched the numbers. And so the probability, we're talking about what, what are the chances of something happening? That's what we talk, that's the, the probability, mathematical probability. So he said that, and listen to this very closely. This is crazy. He says, of all the eight prophecies, for, them, for at least eight of them to come to be fulfilled about Jesus, okay? He said that you would have uh, a chance that a man, any man, any man, that may have lived down to the present time to fulfill all eight prophecies is one in 10 to the 17th power. Now, I wasn't really good at math in school. My favorite subjects were history and science. I wasn't good at math. But here's, here's a way to explain that. One in, tenth, one in 10 to the 17th power. That's one followed by 17 zeros. That's the probability of Jesus fulfilling only eight of those prophecies out of the 300. One in 10 to the 17th power. That's one followed by 17 zeros. Let me give you an illustration of what he used. He said it would be like taking uh, silver dollars and spreading them out through the state of Texas. Now, to get a picture of that, and you know, we all know Texas is a big state. Texas is twice the size of Japan and France. It's about 260,000 square miles. That's how big Texas is. If you take 
silver dollars and spread them out throughout Texas. Texas is about 700 miles in length and about 700 miles in width. Big state, the second largest state behind Alaska. He said it would cover the whole state two feet deep. So picture this. You got a guy who's standing there, you're blindfolding. You say, okay, now I want you to walk through Texas, you're blindfolded, and they mark one of those silver dollars with a red X on the dollar. Now, what are the chances that a man or a woman walking around the state of Texas blindfolded, two feet deep in silver dollars, and what are the chances, think about this now, what are the chances of that person reaching down and picking up that one silver dollar with a red X? That's the same probability that Jesus fulfilled at least only eight of those prophecies. Eight. That's just eight. That's a crazy probability. One with 17 zero behind it. And then he further went on to talk about the probability of if it was uh, one uh, uh, 10 to the, to the 47th power. It, it, the number gets really crazy. It's, it's really mathematically, the probability is mathematically crazy off the charts. There's no way, there's no way that these prophecies of Jesus could have been fulfilled by just people in their own human mind coming up with that. It had to be God. It had to be God. Think about that analogy. One with 17 zeros behind it, that's the probability of him fulfilling only eight of the prophecies. I'm going to share some of those prophecies with you the next time. And there's no way when, you, when, I, when I share with you from the Bible, there's no way you can say, oh, well, that just happened. No. It's, it's too finite. It's too specific to have just happened. So the title of my message, this is the title of my message. And this is why I say it's very important. The title of this message is The Importance of the Word of God. The Importance of the Word of God. Because we have all kinds of belief systems out there in the world. You, I'm sure, have been exposed to things. I don't know your background, but I'm sure, especially in this day and age with the advent of the internet, there's all kinds of teachings out there, all kinds of belief systems out there. There have been all kinds of uh, so-called religious leaders and gurus and people who said they were the one and they were the person to follow and they had the word, they had the truth. But who really has the truth? It's important. And here's why it's important. Because Jesus made this statement in John, the 12th chapter, the 48th verse. He said this. He said, he who rejects me and does not receive my words, has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken to you will judge him in the last day. Think about that. Jesus is saying, look, I'm not going to, Jesus, I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save the world. But he said, in the last day, the words that I have spoken to you, they will judge you. So the words that we believe, the words that we believe, that he has spoken, whether we reject it or, or not, well, that will judge us. And we all know words are important. We use words every day. And a lot of times we use words that are flippantly, uh, the last message I shared with you, I don't know if you had a chance to listen to that one or not, but I, I, I told on the, 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 uh, the race, quote, race word. Wrong, wrong word. There's only one race, the human race. Different ethnicities, but we talk about the word race in plural, like there's more than one race. It's taken out of context. It's, it's a misnomer. So words are important. If I said to you, I'm going to give you a $20 bill, you expect me to give you a $20 bill, not a five. We Words mean something. So my point is this. My question to you is this. Is how your life is right now and where you will spend eternity, is that important to you? How your life is now and where you will spend eternity, is that important because Jesus came to save the world and give us a, a full life. He said, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Okay? And that's why he came. So we're not talking about just eternity, but although that's important. It's important where we spend eternity because everybody is going to live in eternity somewhere. The, sp the spirit that we have, our soul will never, never die. The body we know will cease to exist. It's going to decay. But your soul and your spirit which is one, really, is going to live forever somewhere. Everybody's will. So we're, we're talking about eternity here. Okay? Our lifespan on this planet could be 70, 80, 90 years, whatever. That's a blink, a twinkle compared to eternity. My main scripture that I want to share with you, this is the main scripture. 
Jesus said this in Matthew 24, 35. That's, all. That's the chapter where Jesus is talking to the disciples. They asked him, he said, when are these things going to happen? And when will be the end of the age? It's in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and, and Luke 21. They all recorded. And he said this to them. He said, he said heaven and earth is going to pass away. Think about this. Heaven and earth is going to pass away. But my words shall not pass away. They'll never pass away. It's recorded in three of the Gospels. So that is important. The word of God is going to last forever. Everything we see around us, the building you're in, the clothes you have on, you know, whatever, everything physical is going to go. Heaven is going to pass away. The Bible says very clearly it's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. All this is going to pass away. So, so it's important. It's important that we understand the word of God, the word of the true God. Now, I want to share with you an, uh, uh, an account here. And again, this is, this is about the words of Jesus and prophecies about him. But over in 2 Peter, the first chapter, this is recorded. Now, I want to say this too. I, I like to watch, uh, I, I watch, my wife and I watch crime shows sometimes because of my background in insurance investigation. I like to analyze different cases that come uh, to court. And I just like to just kind of think about, okay, what happened here and who's what and guilt or innocence. And so it's important when you talk about an event and usually if this is some kind of an event, no matter what kind of event it is, it could be a crime, it could be something else, the people that witnessed that, people that experienced that, and what, what did they have to say? Okay, we take that into consideration. So here we have, and let me just say this too, all the evidence in the world, I can stand here or anybody can stand and, and share evidence with you about the validity, the truthfulness of the word of God. But all the evidence in the world won't convince you if you're not open. Uh, we were watching a program one time, my wife and I, and th this guy was clearly not guilty of this particular thing that he was accused of. And the evidence was pretty clear it wasn't him. But his mother-in-law didn't like him. She didn't like the guy. And at the end of the program, she said, I don't care what they say, he did it. And I, was, I told my wife, I said, some people, no matter what, they don't care about evidence. They don't care about facts. They don't care about truth. If, you have, if they have their minds made up, God, only, he's not going to override your will. And I said to my wife, I said, that guy, his, his mother-in-law just didn't like him. He, he, wasn't innocent. he wasn't guilty. He was innocent. But she doesn't like the guy. She had her mind already made up. So I'm going to present some things to you that I think are irrefutable. But if your mind is, not, if your mind is made up and your heart's not open and your mind's not open to it, then I'm sure you won't receive it. But I, I beg you, I, I, I plead with you to receive it. Over in 2 Peter, the first chapter, I'm going to read something to you. Now, this is Peter, who's one of the disciples. In fact, he was part of the inner circle. Jesus had 12 disciples, we all know. Three were his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. And he says to this in, this in the first chapter of 2 Peter, the 16th verse. He says, we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, here's a man recording what he saw. Now, he's talking about this experience that they had over Matthew, the 17th chapter, when they went up to what was the Mount of Transfiguration. He took the three of them up there with him. And this is what he's getting ready to, to uh, describe, that experience. He says, we saw this, okay? We, we, I witnessed this. He says, for he received from God, 17th verse, he received from God the Father honor and glory, which... When such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son, the son whom I love, in whom I am well pleased. He said, we heard this voice. I was there. I saw it. Not only did he say, I, I saw this. I actually heard this voice. He said, we heard this voice, which came from heaven when we were with him in the holy mountain. This is, this is what he's talking about. He said, this is not a fairy tale, something I'm making up. He says, now, here's the part I want to get to, these next three verses. He says, think about this. Here's a man sharing with us. Or not, this is in the first century. This is about, when he wrote this, this is about probably about 50 years or so after this event happened. And I'm going to share with you in a later message that this is real close to the time that this event happened. And yet, in antiquity, in history, we have people out there like Homer, like I said, Aristotle, Socrates. People don't even question uh, Alexander the Great, all these people, people don't even question the history of that. 
and, it's, and it was written year, much, much, much later than what's recorded in the Bible. People pick and choose what they want to believe because of their own biases. So he says in the 19th verse, he said, we saw this, we heard this. He says, we, we have also a more sure, now think about this. We have a more sure word of prophecy that we do well, that we take heed to, to, the, to this as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. What he said is, he said, we, we ought to take heed to this because we have a more sure word. Now think about this. What he's saying there is that we experienced this. We saw Jesus' body. He, 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 the Bible says he was, his, he, he was radiant like, like he was after the resurrection. And then Elijah and Moses show up. It had to be a sight. It had to be something that even Hollywood or the best special effects we have today couldn't even match. He, and th but then he goes on to say, in spite of that, even though that, that had to be miraculous, he says, we have a more sure word than that. What could be more sure than that? What he's saying is that the word, the word of God is more sure than that. Think about that. The word of God is more sure than what he experiences. That's what he's saying. Now, that's hard to get your mind around. Because most people think, well, if he saw something like that. That should be more convincing than the word. But we see in scripture that that's not necessarily true. Because when you read about when, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in John 11th chapter, the Bible says, I, first of all, I read it, I couldn't believe it. I said, he raised Lazarus from the dead. He had been dead four days. And the Bible says that even after that happened, and the people that were standing that knew Lazarus was in that tomb for four days, some walked away and they didn't believe. Get your mind around that. So seeing is not always believing. Seeing is knowing. But if somebody chooses to not believe, they won't believe. So he goes on to say, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation or no private origin. It's not any private origin. He says, the prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So people argue, and it's all out there, people argue about, well, the Bible's written by man, you know, it wasn't God, yada, yada, yada. You know what? When you look at the prophecies I'm going to share with you, there's no way you can come to that conclusion that man just wrote the Bible. It's impossible. But if you have your mind made up and you don't believe that, there's nothing I can say or anybody can say to convince you. I'm asking you to think about it and be open. So that was Peter, okay? Peter, Peter wrote this down. He was an eyewitness. You know, like I said, I like to watch a lot of crime shows because of my background in insurance investigation. And we know that sometimes eyewitnesses can be mistaken in certain cases sometimes. You could have five people in a particular event and they would give you actually sometimes maybe contradictory statements. But we have a plethora, a bunch of witnesses about Jesus's life. In fact, if you take the Bible, in fact, you, you could prove the things in the Bible about Jesus even without the Bible. And by that I mean, look at look at look at the history of our literature, our arts, our science, music that that have been written down through the years about Jesus. You could put together a, a, an account of his life just from that, even without the New Testament. Because of all the things that happened that people wrote about and experienced that they recorded in literature and art uh, and so forth and so on, it's, it speaks volumes to who Jesus was and what he did. Like nobody else in history. Nobody in history ever. In fact, you could take all the people in history together who you can think of that are famous people that did great things and they couldn't even match the, the things that have been written about Jesus or done in arts or literature or science and in every area of, of, sci of, of society about Jesus, he had that much of an impact on the world. We date our system based on his life. It's, not, it's, 2020, it's 2021 right now, 20, 2021. Where do we get that from? Well, we, we, we count it from his life and his death. He's the center of everything. So another, another uh, word here I want to give you on this is, what Paul said. So this is Paul, the Apostle Paul, who uh, we all know he 
God used him to, to write most of the New Testament. And he says this to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16. He says, all, now listen to this, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. You, you break that down in the Greek, it means that it's God breathed. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So, the, and again, people, and I know people debate this. I've heard all kinds of arguments. You read things. People question the word of God. Well, they can question the word of God all they want. But if your eternal destiny depends on what you believe about God, Jesus said, if you reject his words, if you don't receive him, his word is going to judge you in the end. He's not going to judge you. His word's going to judge you. So you're going to blow off his word. People blow off his word and they say, well, man wrote the Bible, like I said, and, you know, we don't, I don't believe, you know. Well, the Bible says that God, this verse says God breathed. He, he breathed on these men, these people. He breathed on them and they spoke from God. And we can prove it from prophecy. We can prove it from prophecy. So they didn't just make this stuff up. So there are, there's some areas I want to get into uh, the next time uh, about specific prophecies that about Jesus' life. There's going to be four areas I'm going to cover. I'm going to cover about Jesus, his birth, his ministry, his death and resurrection, both of those together, and, the, and his, role, his role in the church. And I'm going to show you from Scripture. I'm going to share other scriptures with you too. I'm going to show you from Scripture why anybody that's in their right mind that's open that's reasonable and rational and think about the prophecy aspect will have to con concede and, and be convinced and admit that this Bible that we have that people claim has been tampered with you know I remember when I first got saved and, and I was back in the 70s and I, we were all on the street having street meetings and uh, I had some encounters with some other people that had different belief systems and they were talking about the King James version of the Bible 1611 but King James was, you know, he was a lunatic. He had mental problems or whatever. And I said, look, he, a lot of information is already out there. You can just study this stuff and look. King James didn't interpret the Bible. He had about 50 scholars that he gathered together because they had had some previous versions of the Bible before he did this. And they got together, these 50, about 50, 47 scholars, and they went through the, the manuscripts, they went through the other uh, translation, the other writings, and that's why they came to the King James Version. It wasn't King James himself sitting there interpreting the Bible. There's so many false fallacies out there about the Bible that aren't consistent with truth, and they don't, they don't match up with the facts. So I, I just ask you to, if you're gonna, whatever conclusion you're gonna come to about God, make sure you get facts you get right information because people have biases and they'll put their biases and they'll put them out there. And there's a, so much information out there now on the internet and other places that there's all kinds of things. I mean, some really crazy beliefs down through the years about people out there who claim to be the Messiah or the Christ uh, or the person to follow. They had the truth. And you look at all the history of these people and compare it to Jesus, it doesn't even match up. They can't hold a candle to Jesus and the things that he did. So one of the prophecies, I'll just give you a, a, a tidbit here before I close. I'm getting ready to close now. I only have about a minute left. Is his birth. Real quick. Uh, Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and, and give birth to a son. We will call him Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Talking about Jesus. Now that was done he made that prophecy about 750 years before Jesus came on the scene, okay? That far in advance. And it was fulfilled over there in Luke where the Holy Spirit came and said that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's gonna overshadow you and the Holy One be, will be born called the Son of God. That's Luke 130, 135. That was written about 60 years uh, into the first century. So anyway, I'm gonna close now and Jackie's gonna come and share some thoughts with you. But I just ask you again, if you can stick around for my next series, my, my, my next lesson on this series, and be open, be open. Listen to what I'm saying. Look at the facts of history that we have, not the manipulation that's out there by all these different belief systems, and let your mind receive it so it can get to your heart. God bless you.